Praise the Lord, everybody, and everybody praise the Lord. My name is Elder Jael Russell, International Cool JC Sunday School Association Sergeant at Arms, and I greet you all in that wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, I know many of you were blessed last week by Elder Dr. Graylin Stargate's workshop, and this right here is part two, and I know that everybody's excited. That's why you're tuned in uh, this evening. But before I hand the broadcast over to Elder Dr. Graylin Stargale, I want to give honor to whom honor is due. First, giving honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's at the head of my life, to our presiding apostle, Apostle James I. Clark, to our vice presider and the apostle to the youth, Apostle James May, to the entire apostle board, the entire board of bishops, the entire board of presbyters, our international Sunday school staff, as well as the international Sunday school superintendent, Sister Dolores Griffith, and the advisor to our youth, Bishop Reginald Davis. And for those of you that are just joining us this evening, uh, once again, I greet you all in that wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we have part two of the right leaders at the right time. I'm going to hand the remainder of this broadcast into the hands of Elder Dr. Graylin Stargale so he can deliver part two of this great workshop. You be blessed. In Jesus' name. Elder Stargell, the broadcast is all yours. God bless you. Thank you so much, Elder Russell. God bless you, beloved. My name is Elder Graylin Stargell, and we are so grateful to have the opportunity to share with you uh, part two of uh, the right leader in the right place. Uh, we certainly honor the Lord Jesus Christ because without him, uh, we could do nothing. We honor the uh, presider of this organization, Apostle Clark, and to uh, the vice presider, Apostle May, uh, my pastor, uh, and to uh, Superintendent Griffith, and to uh, Elder Russell again, and to my lady, uh, Lady Stargale. We're so honored to be with you. I pray that what you heard last week uh, made sense, and that uh, today will make sense uh, as well. Will you bow your heads with me as we go before the Lord in prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We realize this of your mercies that we have not been consumed, but great has been your faithfulness toward us. Father, I pray that you will bless us so God during this session, illuminate our understandings, open up our hearts, our ears, oh God, and help us to respond accordingly. Bless every listener, every staff member of this um, magnificent facility and organization, Lord God. Bless this Sunday school, oh God, as they do business with thee and want, oh God, to be an intricate part of the kingdom of God. Bless them in everything that they do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, beloved. Again, today we're talking about the right leader in the right place. And so uh, what I want to share, as you'll see on the screen, uh, and I promised uh, that uh, while uh, don't count the screens, just count the content uh, that we're going for in the screens. And so uh, we left off with uh, what did you inherit as the leader or teacher? What did you inherit uh, when growing this? Uh, the pandemic has turned everything around. And so what did you inherit as the leader? And so I wanna talk about a couple of things. And so uh, you may have to grab a uh, pencil and paper. Uh, and those of you that are technologically sound, you may just have it on your phone or iPad uh, and write these things down because I wanna share from you uh, from the heart. Uh, I was very privileged and am very privileged uh, to have sat uh, under uh, Apostle May uh, the 44 years he was pastor and to serve uh, in a leadership capacity uh, for 43 of those 44 years. So I count myself very honored to have sat under, uh, sometime I call him Moses, refer to him as Moses, sometime as Elijah but to have sat under him for those years. So let me share with you. And so this is not going to be on the PowerPoint, uh, but let me share uh, some 40 something years of ministry uh, from my heart to you combined with uh, academia. What did I inherit? And you may say that uh, now that you're in, uh, uh, we're in the pandemic and it, and we see light at the end of the tunnel, you may uh, have said it beforehand. What did I inherit? See, because there's a challenge and it's a it's a two edged sword. If you in, if you inherited a disaster, then it's a challenge. But the other side is if you inherited a thriving auxiliary. A thriving organization, a thriving church, who wants to be the leader that changes the trajectory of something that is thriving. 
So when we look at it today, I want to talk about a few things that, again, you may have to get your pencil and paper and, and jog these things down. But first, beloved, let me talk to you about organizational spaghetti. Uh, as I said uh, last last week's presentation, uh, I am a university professor. Uh, and prior uh, to that, and actually doing part of that, uh, I spent uh, 25 years uh, as a fire chief. And uh, so I saw a lot of things in my tenure uh, as a firefighter and as a fire chief. And one of the things, uh, if you've ever been in a room that has a dropped ceiling, uh, typically you'll see it in the basement, you'll see it in the office, in offices where they have the, the ceiling that's dropped. And so you kind of you kind of know that everything, any wiring that's on top uh, or any wiring in the in that particular room is up there. And so then they put the ceiling and it looks good and all of those things. Uh, but you can always take a panel and remove it if you need to reach up and get something. So what I want to talk to you about today, what did I inherit? And organization spaghetti is one of those. One of the things that we realized in firefighting uh, all too well if there was a fire in an office, going down a hall, hotel, whatever it was, building, if you had a drop ceiling, after a while, uh, the heat and the fire uh, would eat that up and the wiring would fall down from the ceiling onto the firefighters. And if they were not careful, the, the uh, air tank that you had on, that man or woman had on as they were crawling, and contrary to what you see on television, in real fires, the firefighters are not walking down the hall. It doesn't work like that with the heat and the superheated gases and, and the smoke and all of that. You actually are crawling because uh, the coolest spot is going to be on the floor. And if there's any type of visibility, it's going to be on the floor. So as those men and women are crawling, if that ceiling, all of a sudden, if the drop ceiling gives away and the wiring comes down, they face uh, the possibility of the wire getting caught between the bracket of your harness and the bottle. And so as they're crawling forward, if they're unaware, the wire will catch on the bottle and they'll try to go forward and can't because of the wiring. And then what they have to do is crawl backwards and eventually move their arm and, and detangle from the situation. And when we talk about or organizational spaghetti, a lot of times some of you have inherited positions and what happens even on your job, some of you may have people that uh, you thought were you, you thought or know are incredibly talented and they got into a position and you thought before they got there, man, I can't wait till Bill gets there. I can't wait till Pam gets there. This is going to be great. They're phenomenal. And they get there and a little time goes by and you're, hmm, not quite what I thought. And time progresses and and as time goes by, uh, they don't bother anybody. They don't do anything unethical. Uh, but you find yourself being underwhelmed with their performance and you go, wow. But at the other position, they were phenomenal. I don't know what happened. What probably happened is that if they had the talent and ability that you believe that they had, they probably are a victim of organizational spaghetti. And this is uh, something that I created uh, back, I don't even know how many years back, but I think it was when I was in my doctoral program, but organizational spaghetti. So what happens is a lot of times when you have leadership, because leadership, uh, genuine leadership is ethical uh, and it looks at of growing an organization and things like that. Uh, what may have happened many of those times, if you believe that they were had the talent and abilities, but you're underwhelmed, they may be a victim of organizational spaghetti. And so what happened, their predecessor, the person in front of them, or could have been leaders down from years past that were great, they were nice, but they didn't do all of the things that they needed to do. And so now, you come in or that person comes in and on the floor is a bunch of, for lack of a better word, spaghetti, organizational spaghetti. And so uh, 
30 years ago, it's just maybe one thing that needed to be untangled, untied, and it wasn't addressed. And over the years, that spaghetti got bigger and people just uh, tended, especially in the secular world, if they were close to retirement, do I look at this pile of spaghetti and begin to untangle it or do I just ride it out? And in a lot of cases, they just ride it out. And so the pile gets bigger and bigger. Now you come in or that person comes in and they look and know, well, we've got to move the organization forward. So the best way to do it is for me to, and they untangle it. And in some positions, and maybe some of you are even there, uh, it may be four years that you're in a position and essentially what you're doing is untangling 20, maybe even 30 years worth of organizational spaghetti. And you won't be the person who ever gets the credit or recognition for doing it because you'll never tell anybody how bad it was when you got to that position because you're not someone who wants to tarnish the uh, reputation of your predecessors. So you go in and you untangle it, but the person that comes behind you does a masterful job as it appears. And people go, wait a minute, I thought Bill and Pam were going to be fantastic. I never had any hope that Jamie would do anything. And he or she is awesome. What happened? What happened probably was that person that you were underwhelmed by their performance and you knew they had the capabilities uh, was the person that realized that if we're going to progress this auxiliary organization, then I need to untangle the spaghetti so that the next person can move forward and keep the organization uh, going forward. So that's organizational spaghetti from a, a Dr. Graydon Stargill standpoint. Again, what did I inherit? Uh, I want you to think of a couple things. Um, number one, uh, when we talk about what did you inherit, let's talk about leadership departure styles and leadership departure styles. I'm gonna give you four. A uh, leadership departure style, uh, number one, there's the monarch. Now, if you have a monarch leadership departure style, a monarch believes that he or she is critical and they cannot leave, they cannot take a vacation if they leave that particular uh, position, that organization, that particular rank, uh, the entire system will crumble. Uh, and so they won't leave. And if you want to overthrow, if you want to get them out, you're gonna literally have to overthrow them. Uh, they're not gonna leave on their own accord. And so that's why succession planning is critical. But when you're dealing with the monarchy, uh, they want. And so the challenge in the church, beloved, is that if you have a monarch leadership departure style, they won't leave. He won't leave. She won't leave. So leadership departure, number one, style number one, the monarch. Number two is the governor. The governor, much like the uh, monarch, they're there for the long haul if they can. But with them, they're going to be reluctant to leave. But if they leave, keep in mind, beloved, that they may leave, but it's with an ulterior motive to come back in a higher or greater uh, position. And so they're not just leaving to be a nice person. Uh, they've got an ulterior motive. So now you have the monarch and you have the, uh, the general, the monarch and the general. Monarch, you're going to have to overthrow. The general will leave, but has an ulterior motive. Your third leadership departure style is the ambassador. The ambassador will come in and he or she will move your organization or your auxiliary from where they are to the next level of greatness and do phenomenal. When he or she leaves and goes to the next thing, uh, they have established ties. And so uh, their successor may say, well, I'm so nervous or may I reach out to you from time to time to bounce something off of you as we move the organization forward. And an ambassador will say, absolutely, that's not a problem. And so your ambassador uh, has established ties even when they've left that position, or left that organization. Your fourth one, beloved, is the governor. The governor, like the ambassador, the governor will uh, come in move an organization from the next level of great where it is to the next level of greatness. The distinction between the ambassador and the governor, the ambassador has ties, has established ties after they leave. A governor is there, 
when they leave and go to the next horizon, they, they leave all ties behind. So you're not going to be reaching out to that person. Uh, they're there. They're going to move the organization or auxiliary to the next level of greatness. Then they're on to the next thing. So you have the monarch, you have the general, you have the ambassador, and you have the governor. Now, we'd like from a warm and fuzzy standpoint to, uh, if you think about it, which one of those four leadership departure styles are you? And it makes you warm and fuzzy to think, okay, well, ambassador, move it to the next level of greatness, establish ties. But the reality is that's not how everybody is wired. So question, which one are you? Are you the monarch where you're going to have to be overthrown? Are you the general that you'll leave, but you're leaving reluctantly, but you have an ulterior motive to come back in a higher position? Are you the ambassador who has the heart of the organization and moves it from one level to the next level, the heart of the uh, team or auxiliary? You move it from one level to the next level of greatness and you establish ties. Or are you the governor that moves it from one level of greatness to the next? But when you are gone, you're gone. So those are what we call uh, your four leadership departure styles. And so uh, you have to realistically ask yourself, which one of these am I? The monarch, the general, the ambassador or the governor. The next thing, beloved, I want you to write down is on one side, controller, and on the other side, comptroller, C-O-M-P-T-R-O-L-L-E-R, -L -L -E controller on one side, comptroller on the other side. From a leadership standpoint, let me ask you, let's, well, let's talk about, let me define it. From a leadership standpoint, organizational standpoint, a controller, exactly what you think. Uh, they run things that probably micromanage and and if there's somebody that is new to a leadership position, unless this is your first time in this company, this auxiliary, you don't know anything about it, and you're asking a lot of questions. Uh, micromanagement is a terrible management practice. I realize that you have people that do it, but micromanagement is a terrible uh, management practice. Uh, perhaps if the Lord says the same in the future, uh, if the Sunday school has me back, we can talk about the dangers of uh, micromanaging, but that is a terrible practice. But a controller is exactly uh, what you believe it to be just from the definition. He or she wants to control stuff. And when they want to control stuff, uh, they tend to uh, micromanage. Uh, and the other thing is not so much in the church. Let me say that again, preferably not so much in the church, but in the, in the church, but on your secular job, you may have someone that is hot tempered, uh, they fly off the handle uh, at the drop of a hat. And the danger is if they are in a leadership position, especially a high leadership position, if they are a controller and, they're and a micromanager and they're hot tempered, then they probably engage in uh, what I call landmine management. So if you come in, uh, if there's somebody who got there first and you make eye contact with that person, well, if I step this way and the person, mm -mm. well, how about if I step this way? And so day to day, hour to hour, uh, their landmines based on that manager or that leader's temperament. And so when you have that type of person that's in the top spot and you have people working for them, when they are, when they engage in landmine management, uh, the company, the customer, the residents, or in this case, the students in Sunday school, uh, the church members would suffer because it no longer becomes about providing the highest level of service. The focus now is just not to upset that person in leadership because they're so prone to fly off the handle. Again, we see this in the secular world. Uh, and so it's hard to deliver quality product when uh, the team's goal is just not to upset uh, the apple cart. And so, but a controller is exactly what you think they are. They're the micromanager and all that. And again, we're talking about organizations uh, and leadership. So you have the controller on one side and you can put all the things down that you already know uh, that a controlling leader does. On the other side is the comptroller. 
a comptroller when it comes to leadership and organizational development. A comptroller sets the stage for growth. I'll say it again. A comptroller, beloved, sets the stage for growth. So you have the controller and you have the comptroller. Which one are you? And that's a question that you have to ask yourself, just like with the four leadership departure styles. But uh, are you a controller? Well, you got to run everything, got to have your hand in everything. Uh, the way somebody else does it or anybody does it is not good enough. You've always got to fine tune it. Or are you a comptroller where you set the stage for growth? If you're a controller, especially when you're dealing with the Lord's work, uh, you're going to have to do a lot of praying and dialoguing with uh, mentors and people to help you because this is God's business. And we never want our emotions, uh, our temperament to get in the way of uh, doing the will of God. I, I once was at a church for dinner <clears throat> and the entire kitchen staff, food and beverage, whatever you want to call it at the church, uh, they had a wonderful uh, banquet and uh, some spoke, two people spoke to me afterwards and Everyone that worked in the kitchen and the outside product was fantastic. We saw it, but everyone that was in the kitchen and it was six or seven people uh, had told one person that was the last time that they were going to be in there because of the leader. Now, it was seven people, but they, that was the last time that they, they were going to be in there. They had had enough and they would not uh, work in the kitchen anymore as long as that person was the leader. Here's the kicker. Six of those seven people were related to that leader. And they're like, yeah, no, I'm not working for her anymore. That's a problem. And for those that may say, well, I come at you correct. I just speak my mind. I'm always forthright. If they got a problem, it's their problem. No, that's your problem. Because we deal with people three ways. We work with people, for people, and through people. And if your temperament and your attitude are such that it's disruptive. That's your issue. Okay, so we've talked about the four leadership departure styles. We've talked about organizational spaghetti. We've talked about the controller versus the comptroller. And if you look at the PowerPoint slide, again, the initial question was, what did you inherit as the leader? And so the next question, what does a successful 2021, 2022 look like. Uh, beloved, when you're looking at uh, the right leader at the right time, uh, you've got to do some vision casting and set some goals, but you've got to be willing to, uh, as uh, one author, and I don't remember uh, their name right now, but you've got to be willing to kill the sacred cow. Anybody out there um, know churches and auxiliaries that have programs that don't work or they do something that doesn't work and they just do it because it's always been done and it's almost like a sacred cow and you can't touch it. Everybody knows it doesn't work, but nobody's, a, but nobody will say anything or challenge. Why are we still doing this? This is unproductive. Uh, but what does a successful 21, 22 look like for you uh, when you look at service deliverables as leaders in the international Sunday school, as auxiliary leaders? Uh, are you, working on developing, uh, selecting, training people. Uh, you don't want to wait till there's an opening and then uh, try to guess who can we get to fill in because that's how we got some bad leaders. And because somebody is good at one position is not a guarantee that they're gifted in the next. One of the challenges that we see, uh, and this is in church settings, a lot of times if you have someone that is a gifted teacher, especially if they're a teacher or educator in the secular sector, and they do a great job of teaching uh, at church. Uh, and that church, the Lord blesses it, and that church grows, and they decide they're gonna have a Bible college, Bible institute, something like that. Who do they normally get? They'll ask the person that was gifted as teaching to, to chair that and become the president, the dean, whatever, whatever the top spot is because they were gifted at teaching and delivering does not mean that they are a gifted administrator. 
And keep in mind too, uh, for those of you that are teaching, those of you that facilitate, uh, diversity is critical. And diversity, yes, beloved, is race and gender. But when I talk about diversity from a teaching standpoint and choosing the right leader at the right time, diversity is also about cognitive abilities. Some people learn by hearing, some by seeing, some by uh, hands-on, and some are a combination of all four. When you have a teacher that teaches from one domain, it's typically what they are dominant at. So if your most challenging learning uh, way of learning is hearing. Can you imagine the entirety of your Sunday school? Everything that you have been taught was hearing based. Nothing to read, uh, nothing to see, I mean, just, just hearing based. So again, the goal of leadership, especially when we're talking about growing a Sunday school, the goal of leadership is for you to literally, beloved, change the environment that you're in so that everybody, whether they're down on it, hearing, seeing, hands-on, or a combination of all three. Your goal is to change the environment so that everybody has an opportunity to thrive in your setting. That is the goal of leadership. And when we look at the slide uh, again, <clears throat> we see what does a successful 21, uh, 22 look like? And so you have to write the vision and make it plain as the Bible says. And beloved, uh, as we close part two, I pray that this made sense to you. What you do when we look at the very last slide, what you do, having the right leaders at the right time will help your Sunday school or auxiliary to grow as the Lord would have it to. In everything, prayerful consideration in all areas should never be replaced. Beloved, don't you ever substitute talent for anointing. Don't you ever make a move uh, when you're dealing with uh, developing children and fortifying adults that you don't do without prayer because more things are raw through prayer than the world will ever know. We want you to be blessed. I thank you. Uh, for this time. I pray that uh, you remember those four leadership departure styles. I pray that the organizational spaghetti makes sense. I pray that you have uh, given earnest consideration to am I a controller or a comptroller? Because I know now that a comptroller sets the stage for growth. Uh, Superintendent Griffith, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Elder Russell is the moderator. Thank you. And beloved, all of you, may the Lord bless you. Uh, I want you to be immensely uh, blessed as you do the work of the Lord. And he that have an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we thank you for this time that we've shared with uh, these beautiful people. I pray, oh God, that uh, your will be done in their lives, your divine will. Lord, let what we said today uh, make sense. Let it be impactful, oh God, as they, uh, Build your kingdom as they stand on the wall and do not come down. Bless your people in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Elder Russell, back in your hands, sir. Thank you, Elder uh, Grayling Stargell. Once again, you did an awesome job. So awesome, I had my mic still on mute, you know, when I was getting ready to, to start talking. I mean, I was really soaking everything in, you know, like a sponge, especially when you said, you know, uh, talent doesn't substitute the anointing. And just because you're effective in one area of ministry doesn't mean that you're going to be effective in another. I mean, I'm really uh, enjoying, you know, the, the wisdom that you have shared with us, the nuggets that you have shared with us. And I, my prayer is that everyone, you know, tonight, uh, that watch this broadcast, you know, will uh, also, you know, take heed to the wisdom that you share with us. And don't forget, everyone, you can always watch this video again and go back and watch part one. I mean, he really, you know, shared uh, some stuff that'll be a blessing, you know, to all our Sunday school departments, whether it's on a local level or the diocese level, um, as well as the national level. I mean, he really shared some good things. And some of these um, words of wisdom that he shared can also be used uh, for many of us that are in supervisory roles. 
uh, and our on our secular jobs. So, now the Dr. Graylin Stargell, I thank you once again. And I know you said the Sunday school would love to have you back, you know, to teach you on the dangers of the micromanagement. We'd definitely love to have you back whenever you have time. And, uh, you know, we'll be glad, uh, you know, to set up this platform for you so that you can share, uh, you know, that uh, workshop or any other workshop that the Lord lays on your heart, you know, to be a blessing for God's people. Don't forget, everyone, um, to like and subscribe to this YouTube channel, to the Cool JC International Sunday School Association YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe tonight because it allows you to be the first to know when we upload new content on our channel. And I know many of you enjoyed this uh, broadcast this evening. Please hit that like button. And don't forget, you know, to share this broadcast. Tell your friends and family members about uh, the Cool JC International Sunday School Association YouTube channel. One of the main reasons why we started this was because during the pandemic, you know, some so many churches, uh, you know, weren't active and they didn't have, you know, Sunday school. But we definitely want to have a platform where you can at least, you know, be blessed by the Sunday school department each and every Sunday. So once again, thank each and every one of you for joining in tonight. And remember, Sunday school is big business. We are about our father's business, even in the midst of a pandemic. Each and every one of you, you'll be blessed tonight. In Jesus' name, God bless you. And Lord willing, we'll see you next week. You'll be blessed in Jesus' name.